Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation, and this is Hamza talking. Shout out to David that couldn't make the podcast today. He is really missing out. And I am really excited about speaking to our guest today because I just remember in school graduating from undergrad and everyone was just so focused on getting a job. And I'm sure all these (coughs) years later, (laughs) I'm sure it's the same deal, but there are so many landmines. I, I wish I had known someone to write a millennial's guide to work. Our guest has over 20 years experience or two decades experience working with uh, Columbia students and Georgetown students and helping them to understand what no one tells new grads about jobs. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jennifer Wisdom to the podcast. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Yes. And uh, I'm saying that as today is July 24th, and a lot of parents are happy because in the South because a week from now, a lot of kids will be back in school, and a lot of kids are <laughs> just as upset because a week from now they'll be back in school. <laughs> so, right. you know, the, it's really interesting because I, I am in the Big Brother Big Sister program. Most people that listen to the show know that. My little is a senior this year, so he this book is going to be really good for him, and uh, I'm doing this for selfish reasons as well. And I think that you can never have enough information about uh, what you, what to do once you get the job. There's so much emphasis on getting the job, but what do you do once you have it? Right, absolutely. And and what I hear over and over, I'm, I'm still thinking about getting focused on leadership and advancing, and when I'm talking to young people, they're saying, yeah, advancement's great, but can you tell me what to do about this colleague who keeps gossiping or how do I deal with my boss's temper tantrums. I'm hearing that a a lot of young people have the same questions that you and I probably had back when we were in our 20s, looking at how do I solve these basic workplace issues? And I realized that I I learned a lot through the years with some challenging situations and then hearing about others and really wanted to share that with all the stuff no one tells you about the kinds of things you'll encounter at work. Absolutely. And just to go back a little bit, I'm I'm thinking about uh, freshman year, and I'm also thinking about pledging, and a lot of it is trial by fire. You're you're thrown into these situations that you may not be used to, and those that survive it, you know, have stories to tell. Are there a lot of parallels that new grads can kind of pull back from their – I know they don't have a lot of work experience, but life experience that could prepare them for these jobs? I think everyone has the the set of life experiences that they bring to the table. And for some of those, for for many people, they've had different kinds of challenges and disappointments, and other people have had relatively smooth sailing to this point. I think that the biggest challenge is that everyone thinks they're either, a lot of people think they're prepared, like they know what they're going to get. And they think that the the biggest challenge is going to be doing the actual work, whether that's accounting or DJing or, you know, finance or whatever that is. But for many people, they're shocked to find out that the biggest challenge isn't the work itself. It's not kind of the the intellectual power, the physical power that you need to do your job. It's dealing with all the other people around you. In many cases, dealing with the challenges you may feel in yourself, like I'm not motivated or I don't know how to organize myself or I don't know how to reach out for help. Those are the things that really throw people much more than the content of their work. You know, that that's so true. And, and one thing that I was really interested in, in just doing some preliminary research to speak with you is on the outside, many people that aren't in the Ivy League towers think that it's a shoe in for those graduates. And you're here to say that that's not always the case. <laughs> that's correct. That's not always the case. So being at Columbia, at George Washington University, I worked with a lot of students who, by many accounts, had a lot of um, privilege coming in. Many of them did. And that doesn't mean you're immune from having to deal with a boss that, you know, maybe a jerk sometimes or colleagues or, or anything else. I mean, you still have those things when you get to work. For many people, it levels the playing field in some places. And so then they have the opportunity to 
try to um, learn to grow, which is what I call dealing with difficult situations, learn to grow through a new set of challenges. Mm-hmm. And, and talking about, and then I'll get off of the whole Ivy League thing, that's fine, uh-huh. it is uh, the whole blowout last year with, uh, I guess the new term was lawnmower parents, where you know they pretty much ensured that through other circumstances, the kid wouldn't have gotten into school. They spent an exorbitant amount of money to get the kid into school, but these kids aren't prepared for the real world uh, once they get into the classroom and outside, apparently. I wanted to get your take on the inside. <laughs> yes. I think that happens with, a, with some students where if, uh, if their parents are, you know, lawn mowing a smooth path for them and they don't have to face those kinds of adversities and struggles as a young person, they don't develop the skills that they need to deal with that in a, re, in a workplace once their parents are no longer there. And that, that's a challenge for everyone because the, the individual is, is unfortunately not really well served by not having those skills at dealing with the challenges that everybody has to face just as a virtue of being alive, being a human, <laughs> having physical needs, having um, work needs, those kinds of things. I, that's, un, that's unfortunate when that happens. Um, but, again, if that is the case for some of your listeners, I think this book is, is something that can really help them with that. Absolutely. And we had a, a one percenter on not too long ago, and they were just kind of dispelling the myths of, you know, what's it like to be a one percenter. And one big takeaway was they didn't want their children to uh, have that, you know, they didn't want to be a lawnmower to them. And if they, you know, had gained their wealth through inheritance, through a family business or such, the kids weren't allowed right after uh, undergrad or grad school in many respects they couldn't work at the company. They had to go out into the quote unquote real world and get real world experience before bringing that back. And, and it sounds like uh, that may be something that you would subscribe to as well. <laughs> yes, I am a big fan of, of real world experience. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I'm thinking also with uh, when I was in <clears throat> the 20s, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was a B school person, and at the time we were encouraged to work on Wall Street and for you know for internships, and then afterward we a lot of students would go to Ivy League schools, and that was you know X amount of years ago. And then when I would go back and speak to the, some of the students and professors and such, they said that that has changed, that many students are encouraged to go to China or India or some of these other places that we wouldn't have imagined 20 years ago. So how competitive is it really out there? So that's a great question. I. I am not. I was not aware of that information. Sending so many people overseas to get some internship or early work experience. Um, getting the job is one thing. Keeping a job and being successful at that job and earning respect at a job is another thing. And so right now, the the unemployment rate is relatively relatively low right now, and people can get jobs. Employers are looking for people who are qualified. I think sometimes young people have challenges once they get into the job figuring out how to be successful. Absolutely. Uh, And I think the other encouraging sign is with, uh, you know, yesterday and today, uh, it's just hard not to draw comparisons. But Uh with with technology, it's just a lot easier in that there's different uh, forums or groups that companies have that, you know, I I think they call them the virtual uh, cafeteria where you can find out what the work environment is like before even getting there. Are are you seeing that as far as prepping uh, your prepping graduates to work at all any, any to get a leg up on the competition and also to make themselves more successful at a new job? Absolutely. People are taking a look at everything they can figure out about a company before they go there. And on the one hand, that's, that's not new because people who may have neighbors or parents or someone who knows someone at that company, they would get an introduction and they would meet someone that way. But here, that information is much more available to a much wider group of people. That's fantastic. I think the thing to remember when you're doing that is that most of that information is pretty highly curated. 
and you're not getting you're getting some sense of what's going on with the company and certainly more than you might have if you didn't look for that at the same time it's not totally realistic representation necessarily of what your life will be like if you work there and what your colleagues will be like and kind of the the tenor and the tone of every department and every unit at the company. That, that's a really good point. And that was, brings up my second part of the question because you had mentioned that the unemployment rate is relatively low and, and I would go back a year or 10 years ago or a little bit more, you know, during the, the correction, as they say. And the first things to go were the uh, jobs that, uh, let's just say it wasn't as, as uh, technologically needed or wasn't, mm-hmm. at, it was mm-hmm. more of a, a generalist type position. And in today's market, there, you know, you're looking at what, what makes the most money, right? So a lot of people are, are motivated by different things, but coming out of school, a lot of it is money. And one job that was highlighted recently, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, was a geotechnical, not a geotech, it was a, a gas engineer working in Texas on like oil fields and such. And you can make a lot of money, but they were saying that the work environment is so difficult. So do you work with people to identify like their strong suits and what would make them better in this environment versus another at work? Absolutely. And what you're bringing up is so important because after you've been in college for some time or when you're just finishing your high school time and you're looking for a job, everyone wants to focus on the dollars and that that's the most important. And I get that. I have been there. I understand that. Once you have some basic needs met and you can be a little more choosy, a lot of times people get unhappy with their job. They don't want to do this and definitely don't want to see themselves 30 years later in a job that they hate or realizing that their mental health is suffering or that their family is suffering and they have no time or they're always stressed. Those are, those are really not, not good places to be. So part of what I do is work with people to help them understand what their values are. So one value is for many people is I need to pay the rent. Great. That's one part. But above and beyond that, once you have a basic level paid, what, what is important to you? Is it important to have an environment where you can learn and grow? Is it important to you to have an environment where everyone gets along and it's friendly? It, or maybe it's friendliness isn't as important to you and you, you don't mind a bit of you know, sharkiness in the neighborhood as long as you can um, learn achieve stuff or be seen for what you're doing. These are different values that people may have about what's important to them in their jobs, and it's important to, it's not, not a right or a wrong on this. It really is just a sense of a good fit for what kind of work environment can really help you bring out your strengths. And, and that's a really good point. One, one trigger that you said was 30 years later. And so I was sitting here like, <laughs> yeah. wow, you know, and then the, yeah. you're like, where did the time go? But the, how it triggered me was, is that realistic now? Are, are you still, are graduates, new graduates thinking they're going to be at one company for that amount of time, or are they expected to move around? So nowadays people are expected to move around, but probably our parents' generation, so the baby boomers and maybe the early Gen, gen Xers, have, would have a goal of security which was really important when you're in that, growing up in that time period around get a job at a secure place and be a lifer there. And there are absolutely great benefits to not having to move around and being able to stay in one company and being able to move up through the ranks and be known and, you know, do what you're doing through one company. Nowadays, though, it, that's less common. The pensions are less common. There's less, there are fewer benefits of of spending 30 years at one job, and there's a lot more benefits for being able to jump from company to company. You don't want to do it too fast. You don't want to be flighty and irresponsible. But at the same time, again, it gets back to your values. Are you jumping around because you want to look for higher pay? Are you looking for better experiences? Are you wanting to make sure you're not bored at a job? And once you're there for a few years, you figure out what's going on and you want something else to challenge you. Whatever those values are, go for it. It's just important to know what those are so you know why you want to move. Absolutely. Or I would say also why you want to stay. I think there's also a challenge um, that, that I see a lot with people who are maybe unhealthy stayers 
where they end up staying in a job for a really long time, even though they're completely miserable. And mm. that makes me want, you know, sometimes, of course, maybe the, the kids are in college or you need you a bill to pay and those kinds of things, but that often doesn't mean you can't even look for another job or you can't even try to make your work life better. And I'm a big fan of not being miserable. That is, <laughs> that is one of my values. <laughs> I want people to be happy, and I, I, wanna, I don't want to go into a workplace that I absolutely hate or that, that makes me feel really yucky. So I promote that in other people, but a lot of times um, people are willing to be really unhappy for a really long time, which is, which is so unfortunate. I want to help them see that they have options. Yeah, let, let's stay here for a second, Jennifer, uh, because mm-hmm. uh, I'm thinking, you know, with with uh, some of the media outlets and, and just, you know, I'm not 80 or 90 years old, but, you know, typically a, a business cycles uh, roughly around 10 years. So there is some chatter about a, you know, upcoming correction. And in the last correction where you're talking about unhealthy stairs, and I'm here in Atlanta where people, you know, Either people got divorced, and or they lost their homes because you know one one person one spouse could stay and another mm-hmm. couldn't get a job here. They had mm-hmm. to you know move across country, and it was a lot of strains. Um, if, if we're preparing, and let's hope it doesn't happen, or we could stave it off as long as we can. But if there is a correction, and you find yourself at a job that you were probably gathering up the courage, especially if you're an unhealthy stayer. But now you have to stay. How can you make the best out of that situation? That's so funny that you're asking that because the other area that I write in a lot is around leaving and staying. So I'm really (laughs) glad to have an opportunity to talk about this. I think there are a number of ways you can make the best of a a not-so-great situation from – um, finding new uh, initiatives you could do at work if your if your job allows obviously not all all jobs allow that but taking on a new project um, volunteering for a new project volunteering for something related to work that can make work better but that's not work like for example putting together a company I don't know, softball team or something like that where you can build your relationships within the company in a different kind of environment. There's also ways you can get, you know, you may want to resign yourself to, all right, I'm stuck here the next few years. What else can I do to make my life better and do intentionally do things outside of work that will help you increase skills like volunteering, um, working, using whatever skills you are developing at work with uh, to benefit other companies. Like if you do website development, you can help a nonprofit or do things like that that can help you build your skills so that once that flexibility may come back into your life, you have more um, options because you have more skills, you have more experience, and most importantly, you have that energy and that hope and that optimism to be able to move on. Um, You're not just sitting there every day saying, this stinks, I can't move, I can't leave, I hate my life, right? That's just the worst. (laughs) That, That stuckness is the worst. So there are lots of ways you can try to make the situation better even when you can't leave. Absolutely. And let, let's stay here for a little bit longer because uh, I'm thinking of of the last last decade again where there were some people that were so, you know, like you just said, they were in a rut and they probably just went to work and went home. And if a whole department is let go and they were jettisoned, they they were now competing against those people. They didn't really network, so it was hard for them to get back in the workforce. They were out a lot longer than others. So uh, when you're talking about changing your or building your skill set and, and, and going outside of your comfort zone, I just wanted to spend just a little bit more time there because if you're in the rut, then sometimes you, the universe will push you out of it, but <laughs> you're not you're definitely not going to be ready when it happens. Right, right. You've been asking for change, and you may not like the change that comes. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> one of my really high values for me, and anyone who's probably met me knows this, is that is the value of lifelong learning that I want, I am just so curious, I'm so interested in figuring out how things work and how I can do things better and how I can learn more about what's going on. And so if folks take that kind of perspective where they're thinking, all right, this part of my life is going to be stagnant for a little while, and whether it's because you have little kids, whether it's because of the recession, whether it's because of whatever situation, a divorce or anything else that happens, okay, that's going to be a little stuck what can I do to at least make it 
not miserable. Again, the baseline for me is not miserable, but ideally, how can I make it fun? How can I learn something? How can I get something out of it? And I've talked mm-hmm. to folks who have done those kinds of creative things that turned into another job. So maybe someone's day job is working, doing some financial administration activities, and then they start working with nonprofits, and they end up being able to move into a development position or doing fundraising where their finance background is helpful, but they would never have gone in that direction if they hadn't done the volunteering or the other activity that they honestly just did to help them, you know, stay sane while they're stuck at the finance job. There are a lot of times when that happens. Life is Life is long, you know, life is long and life is short at the same time, but life is long and there are a lot of directions that you can go in to help make yourself happy. I'm, and Jennifer, that, that all that sounds really good, but I huh? just graduated and there's so many pressures on me that when I <laughs> leave the job, the only thing I can do is just fall in the bed. How do I take this time to do all right. these extracurricular stuff that you're highlighting? Right. I get that. I have been there. Absolutely. And sometimes that's all you can do is hang on, try to do as much self-care as you can, catch up on sleep, and just try to, you know, get your arms around this behemoth of a job that you, you just signed up for. I think ultimately, at some point, you're going to need to have some sort of a reckoning if you're in that situation. So is this how I want to continue? Do I see a path? to where I don't have to work 70-hour weeks and where I do actually have some, you know, energy on the weekends to do something other than lay in bed and stare at the ceiling. Do I see a path through? If not, can I make a path through? And if I can't see a path or make a path, is this, is this what I really want to be doing? And for some people, they, they do. They want to crank out work. Maybe they get paid really well. They pay, down their, pay off their student loans or save money or buy a house or whatever. They're happy to do that for a certain amount of time. My recommendation is that whatever you choose, do it intentionally. You know, we've all had those experiences, like you mentioned, where you're like, wow, I can't believe a year went by and I'm still doing the same thing. Be intentional about it. Not like you have to be, you know, every second focused on your next step, but thinking about what makes me happy, where am I going, and what kind of short-term goals do I want to accomplish in the job or in my life, and then what are my long-term goals. And just take a little step once a week. If all you can do is a little step once a week. Let me run some scenarios, and I'd love to get your opinion on the scenarios. Uh-huh. Sure. You game for that? Okay. Yep, so this, this, this is probably the, the most famous one, in my opinion, is – I start a new job, I just graduated, I'm super happy. I show up early, I stayed late, and I'm doing this for like the first, let's say a first quarter. And somebody pulls me to the side and they're like, you're making the rest of us look bad. You need to <laughs> slow down a little bit. How, how, do I, how does Jennifer Wisdom shed some wisdom on that situation? <laughs> Oh, that, so that reminds me of the, the classic stories from, like, manufacturing days where somebody is, is manufacturing their, their stuff on the, the conveyor belt faster than other people, and then the people get mad at them for doing that. So that can happen, um, absolutely. Uh, I think there's, if that does happen, that's, that's a, an opportunity to have your own reckoning and have your own kind of examination of what, what do I want to do at this place. So one is to think about, is this a good fit? And, and not to go first to, like, should I leave, but just thinking, is this a good fit in terms of what am I getting out of this job and what am I giving to this job? You know, I, I remember my first um, summer job was working as an administrative assistant, which I thought was a very glamorous title, at the phone company. And we got there at 9, and then I was doing whatever I needed to do. And then at 1030, everybody stopped and took a break for 15 minutes. And I was like, oh, I was just getting into my work. So I come back at 10, 1045, and then at 12 o'clock, everybody's taking a break. And I remember thinking to myself, this is crazy. Every, like, two, every time I start getting into something, we're taking another break. And all mm-hmm. of the people who were twice my age were like, oh, boy, she's going to learn. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I didn't say it too loudly, thankfully. But, you know, that sense of, wow, this, the pace is different than what I thought. And so if what you want is – security, if what you want is a safe place where you can clock in and clock out and then go surfing on the weekends or whatever you want to do on the weekends, 
then this might be a good place. You can slow down a bit. You can observe more, see what other people are doing, and, you know, maybe not work so hard if that's the, the culture there. On the other hand, if you are a go-getter, if you're really ambitious, if what you want to do is light the world on fire, that might not fit well with you. And you may want to either find a way to, of course you want to get along with your colleagues and not take them off, but you might want to find a way to be able to be your ambitious self in a way that works more smoothly with your colleagues and doesn't make them look bad. How's that? Absolutely. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you get a gold star. <laughs> so mm-hmm. let me – I love gold stars. I, w- I want to stay there for a second. So let, let's mm-hmm. use the go-getter, right? So uh-huh. the go-getter is um, used to working with groups. You know, they, they, they learn that in their internship or what have you. And they get to an environment, and they, they are in a meeting, and they bring up some wonderful ideas, and the, the pecking order in the room is kind of like, ah, oh, that's okay. And, then, and you know, kind of pat that person, pat you on the head. And then a quarter later – they're implementing your ideas and you you're there's no <laughs> no check by your name no gold star for you it's kind of like they you didn't even think about it how, how do you handle that situation yes that happens all the time unfortunately and i think <clears throat> you want to see if there's a pattern that's kind of the first step so it's going to happen just expect i, I what i say sometimes is i say this with love life is not always going to be fair and that happens. If it happens once, you know, all right, that happens. If you see a pattern where you're not being heard or you're not being respected in the meeting or where your ideas are being taken and implemented without you being involved, then that's something where you want to, to step in and see what you can do differently. So if you're not being heard in a meeting, first think about um, asking someone else around what's going on. So if there's someone that's in the meeting that you trust, talking to that person and saying, this is where the curiosity comes in, comes in great hands. Hey, I couldn't help but notice the last few times I was in this meeting, when I opened my mouth, I just felt like people were dismissing me. Am I being oversensitive? Did you see that? What do you think about that? And just kind of get their opinion. You're not being defensive. You're not going in and saying, it's not fair that people aren't taking me seriously. That's okay. You know, you don't want to be that defensive. You just want to ask for another perspective. And it may be that there's a history in that meeting of the junior people don't talk. You never know that. I mean, you wouldn't know if you didn't ask someone that you trust who's not going to shame you for asking that question. So a big challenge that I see is that people are often very ambitious and they're eager, and I'm guilty of this myself, um, not not reading the room in some ways. You know, if you're in a meeting with your boss and your colleague, usually that's a pretty safe place to bring up something. If you're in a meeting with your boss and your boss's boss and that person's boss, I would think twice before you open your mouth because there's there's politics going on in that room that you can't possibly be aware of and you have no idea a lot of times what happened before that meeting and you're unlikely to be heard well in that meeting. So the other part is moving into a position or role and getting the respect that you deserve so that your ideas are taken seriously and that you, um, that you are heard and that you're given the credit for the ideas that you have. And this is, is also something people don't always like to hear, but one of the best ways to earn respect is by doing really simple things that you may think aren't even important, but they are so important. Show up on time. Be prepared, look professional, facilitate meetings moving forward. So when things get off track, you can say, hey, I want to make sure I'm I'm aware of the time. Can we move, uh, get back to this thing or something? You know, doing, you don't have to be the, you know, a a killjoy in the room, but trying to always move toward progress, being, not gossiping, making sure that you're not mean to other people. You're doing these basic courtesy things can get you so much respect and people learn to see you. They learn to to know who you are as a good person. So what you'd love would be to say, oh, hey, Jennifer, I don't really know her, but I was in a meeting with her and she had some good ideas. That's great. Or even, I don't know her, I was in a meeting, but she seemed, you know, she seemed okay. That's fine. 
But what you don't want is, oh, yeah, she was late to meetings or she was always rustling papers or she showed up all wrinkled all the time or whatever. You want to have at least a neutral to positive. And then once you start developing more of those, you can start really working on the positive because you'll be given more opportunities and you'll be able to take more opportunities to, to really shine be, way beyond just showing up. Obviously, showing up is the minimum, but it's, a, it's incredible to me how many people say, oh, well, do I really have to be there at 830? I mean, I'd really rather come in at 9. Come on, just show up. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, it's, the, it's the keep it simple, right? <laughs> right, right. And it's these basic things that I think especially for younger people now who are working with baby boomers and Gen X folks, that showing up on time, being dressed appropriately, I'm not saying you have to dress like you're 70 years old, but you should at least be dressed appropriately, um, and just being prepared, those things mean so much to the to older generations. And, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of effort, and it will get you really far. One thing that we're kind of talking a little bit about it, because you said understanding politics and such, and I always have to defer to Silicon Valley because – in my travels around the country, I, I work with a lot of, uh, we're going to be the next Silicon Valley, right? They're trying to rubber stamp it, and they can't. Uh -huh. But they, there's the argument of, uh, here, I'll use Georgia as an example. We uh -huh. lose, I'm, I'm part of, or I, I was in another life, part of a, the recruitment effort to come to the state. And uh -huh. if we lost, the debrief was, you know, quality of life and things like that. And, or... If it was a biotech or a tech company, there wasn't enough uh, infrastructure, if you will, meaning there wasn't enough companies to kind of bounce around. And mm -hmm. when you're talking about understanding politics and such, uh, I would look at it more of a, like a mid to uh, Fortune 500 company, and there's others that are like, well, you know what, I'm going to work out in this startup environment. So do those same rules apply in, in the larger, more structured environments versus the startup environment? That's a great question. That brings me back to observe. Take a little while and figure out what's going on. And that will give you information about what the norms are. I mean, it's always helpful. I mean, I'm a super nerd, so I am interested in taking a look at what the policies are because that will help you understand what's going on at a company. And I know that's not very popular. Most people never read their company's policies, even if they're supposed to. But I like seeing kind of what are, the, what are the rules? What are the written rules? And then you can observe and find out what the unwritten rules are. So, yeah, absolutely. If you're at a startup and nobody else comes in before 11 and you're showing up, you know, at, at 8 o'clock in the morning, that's probably not going to be a good fit. But I think making trying to do as many kind of take in as much information as you can while you're on your interview and then trying to ask those questions, you know, once you're hired, you know, what time should I plan to be there in the morning? What time do people generally come? What can I expect? And then really soaking everything up like a sponge when you first get there so that you can understand what the norms are for there and make sure that you're aware there may be different norms for junior people than senior people. So you may mm -hmm. have a boss who comes in at 11, but the junior people are expected to be there at nine o'clock sharp or whatever, but be, be aware of that. That was actually, you, you're looking at my notes, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you that for those that read, first of all, hats off to you for reading the policies. And then that was my question. It was like, you know, I'm new. I'm a new grad, and I'm in this job, and something happened, and I wanted to take it to the higher-ups, and the higher-ups had a different set of rules than if it were to happen to me. Right. That happens all the time, all the time. And unfortunately, in some environments, there are different rules if you're, uh, if you're an immigrant, if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, if you're new, if you're from somewhere that's not that area, if your family didn't work at that place. Some places have all kinds of crazy stuff that is not right at all in my book. And if I ran the world, that wouldn't be right. But I think a basic place to start is by looking at the policies that are there and understanding the hierarchy and learning when you can go around it. So one of the chapters in the book is a challenge of how to understand the hierarchy and what, what kinds of, what's the structure of the organization, and then what are the offices that are supposed to be there, that are there 
that may be there in many organizations to work with you on these things, like the Office of Equal Employment Opportunity and a Diversity Office or um, Office of Disability Services and what does human resources do, what is an open door policy, what is a chain of command, and then when is it appropriate to use those resources and when is it appropriate for you to go around those resources. Like for example, uh, I have great respect for my colleagues in HR, absolutely. And I also know that one of the challenges that they face is that, that they often face is that they are there to help the company, but yet they also want to help the employees. And many times that works absolutely fine because helping the employee, for example, um, counter a situation where their boss is discriminating against them helps the company too because it keeps the company, you know, along with the, the legal requirements for non-discrimination. That's great and that works out wonderful. Sometimes what the company wants and what's best for the employee might be different. And it's important to know that as a junior person that the HR person is fundamentally there for the company to make sure the company is doing what it needs to do legally. So if something's happening that may be really wrong, we all may agree, this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening. If it's not illegal, it may be that the HR person is not able to help you in that situation. And then that puts them in a bind, which I, again, I love HR folks, I, but I feel for them when they're in those kinds of ethical binds around when what their job tells them they should do versus what they think is the right thing to do for the employee may be in conflict. So if there's a situation like that, it might, makes sense to talk to someone outside of your job. You may even, in extreme situations, want to consult with a lawyer or, or get legal advice before you go into a situation at work where you might, um, you might take steps that don't end up serving you well. Absolutely. And, you know, as, what, what part of the country are you in, Jennifer? Uh, I live in New York. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I'm asking, I'm originally from New Jersey. So, uh -huh. um, and I tried it down here. I said, well, I'm from South Jersey, but it didn't fly. So, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I grew up in the Atlanta area. So I have that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I went the other direction. I went north. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I was thinking, well, I, I worked with a company out of Princeton. The corporate headquarters was in Princeton. And I did a lot of traveling to the great country of Texas. And it was just really interesting reading, reading the tea leaves, like if we didn't have a hook 'em horns belt on or a class ring, it was kind of, we were carpetbaggers for many years. And you're, yeah. you're just so right on about understanding the hierarchy and how things work. And my question is when you're talking about HR and, and getting involved with HR, are you finding different outcomes with a private versus a publicly traded company? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I have not looked at that. I would say the, the, challenge, the, the challenges that I've seen have more to do with the, the size of the company and whether it's a family-owned company or not. So smaller companies tend to not have an HR program. If they don't need it, they don't have it. Um, and if things are family run, then you are, um, you will run, if you're not a family member, you're going to run into different challenges than you would if a, the, the business is not family run. Yes, yeah. And I'm also thinking of uh, poison, not that people shouldn't go to HR, but, and this mm -hmm. isn't for new grads, but, you know, I guess we learn on the, the road of life, as you said, is uh -huh. if you're in the same industry, those industries talk. So, if you're having an issue or an HR issue at company A, uh, you may be working at company C down the line and they're going to know your history at company A and you may not even get hired because of that. Uh, have you dealt with working with anybody about seeing the bigger picture? I have and that's, um, that's something that I experience in, in working in different universities because people do move around, people do talk and in the same field, um, people talk. And even if something, you think something's going to be confidential, sometimes it's not. Um, and people find out. One of the biggest challenges I get when I'm talking to people about switching jobs and moving to whether they can leave or move to somewhere, move to somewhere else is, when do I tell my boss here that I'm looking for another job? Because they, they want to be the person to tell the boss, and they also want to make sure that they don't get 
um, cut out of opportunities because maybe they're, they're at place A, they're looking for a job at B, they applied for the job, should they tell the boss now? They don't want to tell the boss in case they don't get the job, then they're worried the boss does, thinks they're disloyal or that they're on their way out the door and they're not going to give them opportunities or they're going to make it more difficult for them. You know, or once they get an offer from, from place B, if they take that back to place A, they have to be ready to leave. You know, maybe what they want is to stay at A and they're just bringing in an offer so that the, they're hoping their, their organization makes a counter offer. If they don't, you still have to be ready to leave. That's some more advanced stuff that's more high level than um, kind of advanced politics rather than, than what's in the, the Millennials Guide to Work. But I am working on a, a follow-on which has to do with man Millennials Guide to Management and Leadership that talks about some of these more, um, like once you've been on, once you're out of your first job and you're looking into kind of more advanced positions, what, what kinds of uh, other politics you run into and other challenges. Sure, and 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 that's fine. Uh, we can go back go back to the new grads, so we can back mm -hmm. off a little bit. Uh, but before I do, I, I wanted I wanted to ask you uh, here in the South, right? I, I had to learn it, but it's a mm -hmm. uh, right to work state. So when you're factoring those things, like you said, uh, if you make any reference known that you're a scarlet letter short timer, then you're pretty much out the door. Yeah, that can be a really sticky situation, and many states still do not have protection for LGBT individuals, for transgender individuals. There's all kinds of stuff that can, bad stuff that can happen around those situations. I really um, recommend proceeding very carefully when you are leaving a position. I mean, ideally, you're looking at wanting to secure the next position before you leave the one you have. Um, but in some ways, it can be like like leaving an abusive relationship. If your boss is going to be so horrible to you when you leave, maybe you just need to leave, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. that's, that's just not going to be a good situation. But you can always do your best regardless of what people are acting like around you and how nice or not nice they are. You can always make sure that you are proceeding in an ethical way. You are operating with integrity. You're not intentionally misleading people. I mean, not telling your boss you're applying for a job isn't. It's not like you're lying to your boss. That's kind of a an acceptable area of not giving your boss all the information at once. That's generally okay. But you want to make sure you're acting with integrity. And then, if other people are going to react, however they react, and you can move forward with your head high, knowing you did the right thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what if let's just I want to use an Atlanta to New York example. So uh -huh. I went to school. Let's not say Atlanta. Let's say outside Atlanta, right? Like once you leave 285. <laughs> for those that uh -huh. live in Atlanta, <laughs> no, it's, it's no longer yeah. the city. <laughs> outside the loop. So yep. Outside the loop, right? So let's just say I, I went to college in a small town. And my family's there, and but I really want to go to the big city. I mean, you know, I, I, life is short, like you said, and this may be my only opportunity. What would you say to a new grad that is looking for opportunities in big cities versus uh, staying here and, and, and doing the road let, or doing the road that's well traveled close to home? Well, I'm a person who loves adventure, so I and I'm living in New York. I, I love the big city. I think it really depends on what what your goals are. Everything gets back to your goals and your values. It really does. I think it's wonderful for people who've spent all their life in one type of environment to have a have an opportunity to make it in another environment, whether that's moving from you know a rural or suburban area to a city or whether it's moving from a city to a rural area. I mean, there's so much to learn no matter what you're doing. Um, I think the, the challenges with, the, with moving to an urban area, of course, in the pace may be quite different. Um, the financial situation is often very different, so much more expensive. And you end up learning um, maybe things that you didn't expect you would learn, but that happens all the time anyway. You know, you move to the city, you really want to be independent, but what you end up having to learn is, how to get along with three roommates, um, and you're not quite independent, but that's, you know, that ends up being the challenge that, that you, you spend a lot of time and energy navigating. It doesn't mean it's, it was a waste at all. You learn something else, um, and then you can find other ways to be independent. 
I'm just a little confused because when I watch Friends, they make it look like so much fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a. Those were abnormally large apartments for people with the jobs they had. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I was just talking to a, a, a friend who's in Minneapolis who was in New York um, for quite some time, and we were talking about apartments, and she said it's so much cheaper here in Minneapolis, where I, I happen to be for work today. And she was saying that the whole time she was in New York, she could make it on, um, she always had roommates, but she, her rent was always less than $1,000 a month. So great. That's amazing. You know, but just like, ev- again, just like everything, what are your values and what, is, what are your goals? What's important to you? I, you know, if you're willing to live in, with roommates, then you have different options than if you don't want to live with roommates. And if you're willing to live in neighborhoods where you'll have a longer commute, that's different than if you, you know, if you want to live in, in Hoboken and take the train in to New York City, you're going to have different opportunities for apartments than if you're living, you insist that you want to live in Manhattan. Or if you want to live in Queens, you have different opportunities. This is life. This is all of life. And, and part of what, what I think is important is helping people, again, see that there are these choices everywhere, not get so overwhelmed because you, everyone gets a million choices a day, and then be able to know themselves well enough, be able to figure out who they are well enough, and that we don't start out knowing ourselves, but be able to proceed intentionally in ways that are consistent with our values. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to ask you a question about, this is another scenario, and let's just say I, we did the whole, you know, uh, uh, Green Acres, and so I, I, <laughs> I went to the city, and I'm, work, I'm working at a lar- – I'm telling my age now. So anyway, um, I went to a, a larger city, right? Let's say I'm in New York. And so th- one thing, pet peeve, for, for me initially was working at a, a – we, were, we weren't a super large company, but we were global. And so whenever we were in meetings and we would talk to someone from – in our office in Australia or in London, they were always on holiday, it seemed. And so <laughs> – yeah. Right, you're like, hey, I see, we're we're seventy hours a week. You're not real. You're not you're not bleeding the company colors, and yeah. but I'm new and I'm learning all this. Is there a an ideal way to pos- pr- position yourself to move overseas to work with the company? Oh, what a great question. Um, I don't have a whole lot of expertise in working with you know transferring within companies overseas, but. I, I have a couple of ideas um, because of the experiences that I have had. One is work, first step is work with a company that has offices overseas. That's going to be a lot easier than trying to develop something that's, that's in another country. Second is volunteer. Volunteer for jobs, volunteer for travel, volunteer for present at conferences or whatever else you can do that will get you that experience in other ways. Um, Early on in my career, I paid my own way to go to an international conference, and that opened that one conference opened up so many doors for me. And I didn't have to pay for the next conference because I ended up having funds to support me for that. But that one opportunity was so important. Now, of course, you don't want to go down the road of kind of funding your everything on your own, especially if the company is paying for other people to do these things. But being someone who is open to meeting people in other regions, making sure that you go everywhere else, and making sure that you don't always want to go to London and refuse to go to other places that may be less desirable. Just say, be open to all the travel, and then you'll get sure. the opportunities. You don't want to be seen as a cherry picker that you just want to go to the, the fancy, nice places, and you're not willing to work in the other places. There's something to learn everywhere. Absolutely. And I will say, you know, maybe looking back, you already saw that, but, you know, I was always taught the whole John F. Kennedy thing. And so the fact that you looked at it as what can you do for the company, and I'm not saying everyone should come out of their pocket, but I think that you were maybe given the nod because you did take that initiative. Yeah, that can happen. Again, you want to choose that carefully. And if you're, you know, if you're struggling to pay rent, you, you can't fund a, an international trip out of your own, on your own dime. That's, that's okay. I'm not saying everyone needs to do that. That happened to be something that worked for me. But finding ways where you can take initiative, volunteer, um, offer to, to, to go above and beyond in the area that you're most interested in. 
that can get you a, a lot of mileage and it can, uh, it can help people see you as someone who can, can step up and do those kinds of things so the more opportunities will come your way. Mm -hmm. and, and let's say another scenario I'd love to get your opinion on, and this is a timing issue. So if I get on, if I get in on the ground floor and, you know, I'm paying my dues, like you said, but I notice that everyone that is senior level or C level, they all have advanced degrees and it was so hard to get through undergrad. <laughs> At what point do I determine that I need yeah. to go back and get an advanced degree? Great question. This is a great question. This is a place where I suggest doing some, some of your own research. And I don't mean going into the library research, although you could certainly do that. But talk to people who have jobs you're interested in. You might have heard of informational interviews, but you can talk to someone in your company about how they got to the position they're at, what do they think about this, um, talk to someone who's not in that company but who may be doing something else that you're interested in or in a, a related type of company. I remember having a conversation with someone who was um, working at the intersection. I was in public health, and this person was working at the intersection between public health and business, and he taught in an MBA program for a while. And so after I got to know him a little bit, I asked, you know, I'm really interested in the business stuff. Do you think it would make sense for me to get an MBA? And we ended up having such a great conversation where he was talking about, you know, he asked me more questions about what my experience was, what my degrees were, you know, that kind of thing, and then told me a little bit about his experience and was really able to give just such an amazingly thoughtful response to, you know, you could do it, but I think this is what you would get out of it, and I think to get that, you might be able to find that through another venue that wouldn't be as time consuming, wouldn't be as inexpensive, and would actually serve you better. And so someone like him, like what a gift that was. That was amazing. And that came from reaching out to people that, and asking to talk with them about, can you tell me about what you do here? Can you tell me about how you got to where you are? You can't do that all the time. You can't spend all your time you know, having coffee with people, but certainly reach out and try to build those relationships as you can. And then when you have a question that's in their wheelhouse, they are often so happy to help you. They, people want to mentor you. I think that's one of the big challenges um, that people face is, is trying to find mentors. And they kind of, I, I think there's an idea that you would go up to someone and say, will you be my mentor? And then that person agrees to kind of be your parent or take care of you for the rest of your career. <laughs> that is not how it works at all. It's, always, it's, in my experience, so much more of an informal process where you get to know someone. And part of that is reaching out to people who are senior to you, reaching out to people who are junior to you, and just, as I, I tell myself sometimes, just try to act normal. <laughs> like, try to just be a person. Just be a person. Don't let all the stress of what's going to happen to my career and my job and my rent and all this other stuff, don't let that throw you. Just try to get to know somebody as a person. And over time, you'll build really wonderful relationships with people in complementary fields, people in very different fields. And then when they have a question, make sure that you help them out. And then when you have a question, they'll help you out. That's how it works. I love it. I love, and that, that's a really strong point. I, I want to stay there, but I, I want to go to the next part where you could say, hey, yeah. you know what, but that, that person, I want them to be my mentor, but they're a rock star at the company. and They won't look at little old me. I'm just a new graduate. So how do I find time without being bothersome? Well, that's a good, that's a good question, too. I, there's a couple of ways. So one is if there are opportunities to work with that person, you can work on being around them and see if you can kind of warm your way into their orbit. So that's one, if that happens. Two is you can do some more research on that person um, by looking to see any presentations that they've made, anything they have on YouTube or on the Internet around what they're doing. So then at least you know, when you do get to meet them, that'll be, you'll be more prepared and kind of follow what they're doing and learn from them. You, can, you don't have to have the permission to learn from them. You can just learn from them when you see what they're doing. Um, and then the next is you can always reach out. Um, I would try to check if they're a real superstar, like the president of the company or something, or someone on the board of trustees. You might want to check on kind of the politics of, you know, I'd like to get to know this person. Is this okay if I reach out to them? In some places, um, like at many universities, reg most staff and, and faculty can't reach out to the people on the board of trustees. That's just not done. But you don't always know that when you go in. So you might want to ask around that. And I would say the last thing is ask. 
You know, if you have a, either your boss or another mentor at the company, you say, hey, so-and-so really seems amazing. I've been looking at what she's been writing. I've been, I've been so interested in what she's doing. I'd really love to get to know her. Do you know how to do that? You, you'd be surprised. Sometimes they'll say, you know, no, I, I don't, but I'll keep it in mind, and an opportunity will just appear. Or sometimes they'll say, oh, yeah, here's an opportunity, and they'll, sh- they'll open the door for you. No, you're right. That, that's a good point. And I, I think the, those are two takeaways. Um, one is I, I've been in environments where it's actually encouraged. So they, there are people at the top of the ladder actually reaching back. So it's mm-hmm. actually encouraged to have that mentor program. And then just, I think it's in real life, and I'm sure you'll agree, that if somebody's done their research before they've talked to you, I mean, I've been blown away, and I've gotten feedback when I've done my research on other people, like, holy moly, and they'll spend more time, and you're not just kind of like, get away from me, kid. Absolutely, absolutely. You, you need to hold up your end of the bargain. I think sometimes, especially if you're, if you're miserable at work or you're having a hard time and other things aren't going well, you just you want someone to take care of you professionally, and a lot of times that that is unlikely to happen. But what you can do is, you know, pull yourself up, do your research, come in with targeted questions. You're not going to ask them like, "What do I need to do with my life?" You want to try to ask targeted questions that they can reasonably, you know, have have some kind of an answer for, and then over time, and make sure you thank them afterwards follow up, let them know how things went. There are a few things more delightful to a mentor than having a mentee write and say, hey, I really appreciate our conversation last week. I took this step as you suggested, and it worked out great. Or it t- I took this step, and it didn't work out how I expected, but I learned something. Like, that's what every mentor wants to hear. So if you keep doing that and, and make sure you don't try to overwhelm them with trying to ask them to be responsible for your whole life, you can get so much information and so many people are willing to just give it. Now, one of the other recommendations I make is think about what, be, be intentional and be thoughtful about what you're looking for in a mentor. You may have, you likely have different kinds of mentors who help you in different situations. So for example, when I think of people that, that have really helped me over the years, I have one person who's a go-to on politics. How do I navigate a political situation? And I have someone else who's a content person. How do I get this thing done? Or like, how do I understand this concept or write this paper? Someone else helps me on that. I have somebody else who is just the most amazing cheerleader. And I don't go to that person for politics, just like I don't go to the politics person for cheerleading. I go to the cheerleader for cheerleading and just say, I need some help. Can you help me? And then they pump me back up and I'm ready to go out. And I have someone else who I didn't understand the value of this for quite some time. But that, he knows everyone in the field, and he knows all of their personal relationships. So he can say, oh, yeah, that guy, his wife is the head of this program. And so be aware that they talk a lot about what happens in these two programs. So if you want to get a message to her, sometimes you can go through him. Or this person used to be at that company, and so they still have connections there. Or there's some bad blood between this person and that. That's really valuable, too. So again, once you figure out what people's expertise is, whether it's official expertise or kind of content expertise or something else like knowing all the relationships, go to them for that kind of information. That's where they can be enormously helpful. And then work on cultivating your own expertise and make sure, I always say this, make sure you pass it on. Help somebody else up. This is not just for you where you get to soak it all up and and hold on to it. You are required to pass it on. Absolutely. Uh, one 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 a quote that I love on your site is "Dream big and then dream even bigger." And I know we <laughs> yes. it it was only an hour to hour has flown by. Where has the time gone? We always say that. And I think we still just scratch the surface. And so if you're still overwhelmed and you're like, wow, I just started this job and this was a great start, you might want to buy her book So and, and get in touch with her. She has speaking engagements and what have you. But instead of me telling that, I'd love for you to, to give out your website, your social media, and how people can get in contact with you. Sure, absolutely. I am on social media at Lead with Wisdom. And then my website is leadwithwisdom.com. 
And the book is available on Amazon and where, wherever books are sold. You can always ask for it. And my email is jennifer at leadwithwisdom.com. And I put a plug in the book. And anyone who's listening, if you have a work problem that you just can't wrap your arms around and you want some help, feel free to email me. I love, love, love doing the stuff. And I'm really excited about getting this information out there and then working on the management and leadership one to help people a little further along in their careers. And I, this is just absolutely what I love. Thanks you're for actually, Yes, you're walking the talk. You're actually giving back, just like you said. <laughs> of course. Of course. Of course. Awesome. Well, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. Shout out to David that couldn't make it today. You missed a good one. And uh, thank you, Dr. Jennifer Wisdom, for joining our podcast today. Let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers.